I told you there would be more videos and here I am delivering on that promise. For those of you who are new to this channel, I'm Valerie Geary. I am a writer and a reader. This channel is where I come to spout off about books, writing, storytelling. Whether you're new to the channel or an old friend, I'm glad you're here. This video is the beginning of a new era for me or the same old same old of what I've already been doing. Hopefully I like this format and I can kind of keep it going. For this video, I have picked out three thrillers from NetGalley that looked interesting to me. And these thrillers are coming out either later this summer or in the fall. And I wanted to read through them and find out if they were any good, if they were books that you needed to have on your radar or not. Enough chit chat, let's get to the books. I started reading You Can Trust Me by Wendy Hurd a couple of days ago. You Can Trust Me is being pitched as a thriller. It's about two young women, Summer and Leo, who are kind of on the road. They're living out of a land cruiser. They are con artists. They are friends. They take care of each other. I think Summer sees herself as Leo's protector, kind of like a big sister vibe. They both come from very troubled pasts. I'm not fully 100% clued in onto these troubled pasts yet, but we're getting hints. The book starts out with Summer and Leo at this big club, at this party. Summer is pickpocketing, taking their wallets, taking their money, taking their credit cards. But Leo is out to catch a bigger fish. She is there to meet and date a billionaire. And I've just reached the point where Leo has spent the night with this billionaire and has disappeared. And this is one of those books that I feel like the less you know, probably the better. I'm really being sucked in and drawn into this story in a way that I really like with thrillers and I'm hoping that continues. We are experiencing a very strange spring here in the Pacific Northwest. The flowers are blooming, the cherry trees are starting to bloom, and yet it is still kind of snowing every once in a while, which is not something that usually happens in the Pacific Northwest. It's April as I'm filming this, the beginning of April, and usually about this time we're getting some good spring summery weather, some 70 degree days. We haven't really gotten that. I've been at this day job now for about a year. A year. It seems like longer. I have found that because of this day job I've been reading less and a lot of people who work and do other things they'll use audiobooks and I wish I could do that but with my fiction I really can't concentrate on audiobooks. So my most recent experiment is to set aside 30 minutes a day, that's it, just 30 minutes, to try and get some good reading done. I turn off all devices, sit down, snuggle up with a blanket, a hot cup of tea, set a timer for 30 minutes and just really dig into the story. So I have a little bit of time right now before I'm gonna go meet friends for like a little yoga session. So I'm going to dive into 30 minutes of this Wendy Heard book. And for whatever reason, I cannot remember the title when I'm not like looking at a screen. You can never tell, is that what it is? You can hear me. I, <laughs> a hot tip to publishers, really try to nail a title that people remember because this one is not sticking with me. <laughs> that said, I am enjoying the book quite a bit, so at least I'll be able to talk about it. And I really, I really like the cover. The colors are fantastic. I like the silhouette of the two friends on the front. Obviously I can't see it as I'm filming this, but you all can see it. You can see what the title is. Write that down. Order this book. I mean, I don't know. Let me finish it first and then we'll decide if you should order it or not. Ryan went to go grab us dinner. That's so nice of him. So I'm gonna sneak in some reading time. You Can Trust Me, I finally remembered the title. It's giving me some really hardcore White Lotus vibes right now, which I am obsessed with that show. And so I am a little bit obsessed with this book. The author has done this thing with the narration where she's going back and forth switching back and forth between Leo and Summer, between both the main characters. And we're getting just enough of Leo's point of view. Leo is the woman who has gone missing in Summer's point of view. And we're getting just enough of her storyline to just be like completely freaked out. There is something very wrong going on with this whole story, with these relationships. I just feel like this building dread. I'm almost at the halfway point. I am hoping for some kind of big twist, big turn at that halfway mark. We'll see if I can get there tonight. It's Friday night at eight o'clock and I am in my PJs in bed, getting ready to read You Can Trust Me. And that is how you know you are reading a very excellent book. 
I am two thirds of the way through this one and I can't put it down. Obviously, since I canceled all my plans to be here in my snuggly bed with this thrilling book. I think I know where this is headed. Like, I think I know what the twist is, but I am not mad about knowing the twist. And I always assume that there's going to be like one extra little zing at the end. But I do kind of think I know what's happening. I just don't know how it's going to end. The two women in this book are still very much in danger and I'm still very much nervous for them and I really am like connecting with both of them as narrators and I really want them both to end happily ever after in some way. I know thrillers don't normally end happily ever after but I would like them both to be alive at the end of this book and right now I am not entirely sure that's going to be happening. It's quite possible that You Can Trust Me by Wendy Hurd is one of the best psychological thrillers that I have read in a really long time. I like psychological thrillers, suspense thrillers, for the most part, but sometimes when I'm reading them I find them a little bit unbelievable or kind of stretching the bounds of what is possible. Sometimes the connections between the characters seem a little too convenient or sometimes it just seems like really way out there. I have to really try and suspend my disbelief sometimes for thrillers. Now with You Can Trust Me by Wendy Hurd, I did not really feel this way at all. I felt it was a very engaging book with very engaging characters. What the author did is something that you see frequently in thrillers where you have dual narrators and a dual timeline. For whatever reason, with this book, it worked so well for me. You have two characters, Leo and Summer. They are young women in their, I think, late 20s and early 30s, and they have found each other through a set of circumstances, and basically they are nomads, they live in a van, they are con artists, pickpockets, they live a life kind of outside of the bounds of society. They're really close, they have a very sisterly bond. They set up this meeting with a very rich man. Leo is supposed to be dating him and conning him and taking him for some of his money. There's a little bit of disconnect between Leo and Summer in terms of what they want for their lives and where they want their futures to go. So we see all of this at the beginning of the book. And then at some point, things just start to tumble completely out of control. These women find themselves swept up in this society of rich people. There are secrets. There's a claustrophobic island. This unsettling feeling of dread. I wasn't sure who, if anyone, was going to survive at the end of this book. I think one of the other things with thrillers that I kind of don't always like is when there are a lot of shocking twists and turns. Don't get me wrong, I do like twists, I do like shocking turns, but sometimes with thrillers it seems like that is only the point of the story. Like how can I shock the reader? How can I just make it seem so unbelievable and so just like gasp? I kind of like the more character driven thrillers, the thrillers that feel very organic in terms of plot and pacing, and I do think that You Can Trust Me did that pretty well, where I was not only turning the pages because I was desperate to find out what happened plot wise, but also turning the pages to find out how these characters came to resolve some of the issues that had come up at the beginning of the book, and then also if they were going to survive or not. There was a surprising layer of emotional depth to this book that I wasn't fully expecting. And then yeah, like I said, there were some White Lotus vibes, some creepy rich people getting away with murder vibes. And I think this would be a great book, a great thriller to add to your summer reading stack for sure. I'm admittedly a little bit of a mess right now. I am feeling tired. It's Thursday. I'm about to sit down and try to get some writing done, just like 30 minutes. Then I also want to try and get some reading done. I started a new book a couple of days ago. I haven't gotten very far in it. This book is Come With Me by Erin Flanagan. I read Erin Flanagan's debut novel. I think it was her debut novel, Deer Season. If you're a frequent visitor to this channel, you know that last year I read through the Edgar Award nominees and Erin Flanagan's first book, Deer Season, was one of the nominees for best debut novel, I think, or best paperback first edition, something like that. And I really really love that book. It had a really kind of unique character, unique writing style, and I am excited to dip into another Erin Flanagan book. Come With Me sounds like a book that is right up my alley. It is about two women who have some kind of past history together. They are friends. I'm not entirely sure yet where we're headed with this book. Right now I feel like I'm teetering on the brink of something big and something important. Gwen has gone through a monumental life change and has reached out to Nikki, her old friend, and we'll see where this goes.
I feel like last night's video was a little bit chaotic. Like I didn't do a very good job describing Come With Me by Aaron Flanagan. After I got done recording, I was just kind of like, wow, that was all over the place. I have no idea what I was talking about. It was kind of like a spur of the moment video, which honestly are probably the best kinds, right? So I am back to give you a better description of Come With Me by Aaron Flanagan. The book centers around a woman named Gwen. In the very first chapter, Gwen experiences a huge life upheaval. Her husband dies and she is left alone. Now she's a single mother, she's a widow. Her husband left their finances in shambles and she's trying to pick up the pieces of her life. Gwen has been a stay-at-home mom for most of her life. The last time she had like a real big person job was right out of college when she was an intern for some kind of corporation. So she's trying to figure out what she's going to do with her life, how she's going to make money, how she's going to take care of her daughter. She hops online, looks up this old company, come to find out one of the women that she interned with is still working there, Nicola. She reaches out to Nicola for help and Nicola suggests, hey, put your resume in, let's get you in for an interview. I think I have a job for you. Nicole is being very nice, she's being very generous, and yet there's something just a little bit off about her. As the reader, we especially see that because we are getting glimpses of Nicola. Nicola? 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 It's probably Nicola. We are getting glimpses of Nicola in her past life, like as a child. Some of the stories that she's telling Gwen as an adult just aren't matching up to the Nikki that we're seeing as a child. There are some gaps in the story, some lies even. Right away I'm thinking something is off about this woman. Gwen better watch her back. This does feel more like a slow burn thriller. The book is definitely building to something. Every chapter gets a little bit more tense. Gwen is kind of this naive, innocent, she's been very sheltered her whole life. Now she's trying to take her care of her daughter and it's almost like this vibe of I'll do anything to take care of my daughter. And this feels like it could be a dangerous path for Gwen to go down. I am enjoying Come With Me in a similar way that I enjoyed Erin Flanagan's first book, Dear Season. The way she dives into her narrator's emotional um, landscape is pretty interesting. TGIF, I am done with my day job. And I am thinking that this weekend is supposed to be kind of crummy again, just kind of rainy and cloudy. Ryan has a big project that he's been working on. And I am thinking I'm going to take a writer weekend and just try and crush some words on a new draft. I do want to get some reading done, but I do really want to focus on writing this weekend. I'm about 30% of the way through Come With Me. I would like to maybe try and finish it this weekend or at the very least get about three quarters of the way through. I am gonna shut down my work laptop and make a cup of tea and then set some goals, some intentions for my writing weekend. I actually think I might record that as well. I don't know for sure if that's gonna be a video that ends up on YouTube. But I know some of you have expressed interest in seeing kind of behind the scenes of what I'm working on and my writing life. So I might do a little bit of filming. I do want to make sure that I'm focusing on creating new words, getting new words down on paper. Recording can kind of be a distraction. So we'll see how it goes. This video, the three thrillers to look out for in the summer of 2023, will probably go up before the writing video. So um, no promises, but hopefully there will be a writing video in the future. I do feel like I'm not ready to write yet though, so I might take a 30 minute reading break right now. That sounds like maybe just what I need. It's Saturday night. I have spent most of today writing. I wrote like 8,000 words, over 8,000 words today, which has made my brain feel wrung out, but like also incredibly good. It's been a long time since I've been able to spend that much time writing and get that much done. And so feeling good, feeling a little bit more like myself today than I have in a long time. So I'm gonna spend the rest of the evening snuggled in bed and reading Come With Me by Erin Flanagan. That's the book, right? Gwen has moved back to her hometown and she's gone back to her first like big corporate job, her only corporate job. And I'm a little cringy for her, just kind of watching her try to fit in and figure out the rules. And I still don't really trust her friend Nicola. Something shady is going on there. I'm almost at the halfway point, kind of hoping that something picks up here soon. 
It's not that I'm not enjoying it. I very much am. Still a bit of a slow burn. I'm three quarters of the way through Come With Me, and this book has gotten under my skin. It is so creepy, and also I just can't stop thinking, like, look at that thing coming on my head. It's the curtains. Oh. <laughs> Who can we ever really trust in this world? Do we really know our friends? Like, are people just being nice to us for ulterior motives because they're all psychopaths. Yeah, this book is creeping me out, but like in a very subtle way. One of those slow, creeping, insidious books that just gets under your skin and you're just wondering who is the bad guy here? Is it the narrator? Is it the narrator's friend? Is it no one? Is it all just one big misunderstanding? That was a twist that I did not see coming. The ending of Come With Me by Aaron Flanagan blew me away. I had this idea of where I thought the book was headed and then it kind of went in a similar direction, but in a way that I wasn't entirely expecting. And so, you know, kudos to Aaron Flanagan for surprising me. I ended up really loving this book. It was a bit of a slow start for me and it kind of took me a little while to get used to the characters. Both of them were kind of intolerable in places. Gwen was a bit of a wet blanket, but for reasons that were perfectly understandable and I empathized with her. And Nicola was just manipulative and mean at times and just creepy vibes. But then also, the more you learn about her, the more you sympathize and empathize with her. It was a very interesting thriller in terms of how the story unfolded. The more I think about this book, the more I think it would make a great book club book for people who are looking for a thriller that is accessible and maybe not as intense or filled with violence as some of the other thrillers that are out there. There weren't a lot of like triggering themes in this book, not a lot of content warnings that I would give. It was fairly straightforward as a character study, but with kind of a good intense pacing of the plot, a lot of good secrets and mysteries and twists to be revealed. Obviously, it is a thriller, so there were some aspects of violence and harassment and that kind of thing, but I think that Aaron handled it in a way that would be really accessible to most readers. So I think that if you're in a book club and you are looking for a psychological suspense, a psychological thriller, something that would keep the readers in your group on the edge of their seats, I think this would be a good one to recommend. It also has a lot of different layers and different things that could be talked about in a book club, including the different characters, their pasts, the things that they have gone through. There are elements of grief. There's mother-child aspect. There's the toxic female friendship again. Similar to You Can Trust Me, Come With Me had two main character female friends. Obviously very different tone, very different style, very different friendship, but similar in the way that we were looking at two women navigating the world and navigating their losses and their traumas. Yeah, a lot to discuss with this one, a lot to unpack with this one. I thought this was a great book. I think this is a perfect summer thriller for your book club. We are having the most lovely stretch of summer-like weather, and of course, I caught a cold right when the nice weather happened. But I'm still trying to enjoy it. I'm outside on my back porch, enjoying the finely warm temperatures and finely sunny skies. I have just started reading The Taken Ones by Jess Lowry. I recently read another Jess Lowry book, um, Litany, I think is the name of that book, and it was fine. I really liked her writing style, and I liked the mystery elements just kind of the premise wasn't what I wanted. It was a little too child in danger for my likings, but I do think maybe that's kind of what she writes. Some of her other books are well known for being like small town, child narrators, children in danger, that kind of thing. And this one that I just started, The Taken Ones, I think may end up being kind of a similar thing, except for the narrator is an adult right now. I'm not very far in this story, admittedly, so I don't really know a whole lot yet about what's going on. There was this very terrifying prologue of these three girls going into the woods to have like a picnic and go to a swimming hole and then they see something that terrifies them and we don't know what happens. The prologue ends and we are thrust into the future to a new narrator, a detective a agent, I think, an FBI agent of some kind, and she is called to the scene of a very strange crime and I'm gonna just sit here and relax, read for like a half hour, 45 minutes and just kind of try to feel good. <laughs> Thank you.
I definitely think I'm going to love this book. I mean, I'm still pretty early in, but this is like my jam kind of a book. So The Taken Ones is referencing some children who were abducted in the 1980s. And so that was what the prologue was about. These three girls, two sisters, and one of their friends go into the woods. They're going to go swimming at the swimming hole. They take a picnic. Something bad happens in the woods. These crows are loud today. Cut forward. 30 years or so, and our narrator is Van. She has recently moved to work at the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension in Minneapolis. Before that, she was working for the Minneapolis Police Department. Her partner died. She was being harassed at the police department, so she got another job where she has been mostly at a desk job investigating cold cases. And so she is called into this crime scene because it is connected to the cold case of the girls who were abducted in the woods, the taken ones. That is the setup for the story. And I'm assuming we're going to be investigating the cold case and also the current crime. There's definitely some tension between Van and the police department. It seems like she has some history with them that could make this case challenging and tricky and I'm very excited to keep reading and see what happens next. I really left you on a cliffhanger there, didn't I? So let's talk about The Taken Ones with Jess Lowry. <sighs> there were a lot of things I really liked about this book. What I didn't know was that this book actually came about, it is the second book in the series, in the Steinbeck and Reed series. The first one wasn't a full length novel. It was a short story that was part of a collection that Amazon was doing, the Getaway series, I think. And Jess Lowry wrote a short story for that called Catch Her in a Lie. And it featured a detective, Detective Van Steinbeck, and her partner Harry Reed, and they are part of the Bureau of Criminal Investigations or something like in Minneapolis. But they are tracking this woman who is a suspected serial killer down in Costa Rica, some jungle city, I believe. And I didn't realize when I started The Taken Ones that that short story kicked off this series. That short story came before the full length novel. I just went into the novel not really knowing what I was getting into. And I really, really loved the partnership between Harry and Van, the two detectives in this book. They both had very unique personalities. Van is a morally gray, complicated detective with a lot of layers to her personality, a lot of history and backstory that we do get to see a lot of in The Taken Ones. Some of it came from the short story. Some of it seems like it's still going to be developed within the series. There also seems to be secrets about Harry, who is the forensic pathologist, I think, in this book. Secrets that we didn't uncover in this book, but that may come up in future books. So in that aspect with the characters, I really love this book. I liked the cold case mystery style of it. I do love a good cold case. And this one featured around some girls who had gone missing in the woods about 20 to 30 years before the story starts. And then a current case comes up and there are some similarities, some connections between that cold case. So Van and Harry are working on the cold case. They have some issues with the Minneapolis P Police Department. The investigation is uh, difficult for them. And there was also an unexpected paranormal psychic element with these characters that I wasn't fully expecting, but that I did enjoy. I was feeling very hopeful about this book and about this as the start of a new detective series until we got to the reveal of the bad guy, the villain in this book. So I'm gonna go ahead and say spoilers here. I'm gonna be talking about the end of the book and about the bad guy and all of that. And I will try to keep it as vague as possible in case you're interested in reading this book and don't want too many spoilers. But the thing that I have to talk about is kind of the crux of the book and what makes this villain the villain. And so it is going to be a spoiler. I'll put a time stamp down here where you can jump ahead to that will be spoiler free. For those of you who are still with me, let's talk about disability in fiction for a second. I think that it is perfectly okay for an able-bodied writer to write a disabled character. I don't have a problem with that. I think that writers can explore any number of different types of people and personalities and conflicts and issues within the realm of humanity, and I don't think they have to have a lived experience to talk about it in a way that is meaningful and sympathetic and plays well with the story. Unfortunately for this book, for The Taken Ones, the author chose to give our villain a disability, a very real disability. The villain in this book, who is a murderer who has kidnapped some children, is given the diagnosis of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. I don't know if I fully pronounced that right. It's more commonly known as EDS, and it 
has a range of symptoms and a range of disabilities. One of the possible ways that EDS can manifest in a person's life is with hypermobility, where their joints dislocate with a frequency that is not seen in an able-bodied person without EDS. So the villain is given this diagnosis or the detectives come to this conclusion because basically the villain is folding himself up and hiding in very narrow, thin places throughout this book. In a tree, in the hollow of a tree, in a very narrow crack between two buildings, in some kind of air vent situation, and I think finally like in a stove. And the explanation that's given is that he's able to do this because of EDS, because he has hypermobility and can dislocate his joints at will. And again, I don't have a problem with able-bodied writers writing disability, but this is following the cliche and the stereotype and the trope of disability equals villain, disability equals monster, disability equals grotesque, freak show, that kind of thing, which I don't like to see in a book, which I think is problematic in a book. I have a friend who writes, um, she writes amazing books, and she also lives with EDS and has lived with this disability for the majority of her life. I don't have EDS. I don't know what it's like to live with it. I don't even really know a lot from her perspective because EDS is not the only thing that defines her. It's not the only thing that we're talking about when we get together. We talk about a lot of things. There's a lot going on in her life. I'm pretty sure she can't fold herself up into small places, nor would she want to. From my talking with her and spending time with her, EDS with hypermobility, the dislocation of joints is a very painful thing. And so it was frustrating to read this book where we have this monstrous villain who is using his disability in kind of an almost freakish paranormal way. And I don't know, it was like this X-Files vibe almost, except for the author chose to use a very real disability that real people live with and experience on a daily basis. There just wasn't a lot of sympathy and care taken with how EDS was discussed and described in the book. And so that was just kind of really disappointing for me. The language when they were talking about the villain was, you know, things like monster and grotesque and horrifying and this fear and panic. And yes, he's a bad guy. He's dangerous. But it was almost like equating the two. He's dangerous because he has EDS. EDS caused him to be a villain. And I think that's where the author went wrong with including disability in this book. As much as I was enjoying the mystery aspect of this book and the detectives and the way they were playing off of each other, I feel like I can't really recommend this book because of the way that the disability, the EDS was handled. So back to my friend Elle, who is the one who lives with EDS. She wrote a book recently. It just came out um, like a month ago, two months ago. I don't know what time is. It's called Another Elizabeth. This is by Elle Mitchell. And in this book, we have another villain who has EDS, who lives with EDS. So it's not the fact that a villain has a disability that's bothering me. It is how the author handled that villain, the layers that they gave or didn't give in the case of the Taken Ones. Another Elizabeth features a villain who has EDS. She lives with EDS, but she is a complicated, layered character who also has a lot of other things going on in her life. This is a serial killer book. It is violent. There are gruesome scenes in here. And there's also this like layer of humanity where we watch this woman moving through her life with her disability while also trying to figure out who she is as a serial killer, but also as like a human in the world. And like there's complexity here and depth and care. And yes, I think part of this is because L. Mitchell lives with EDS and so she has that insight and is able to bring that care into this book, into her characters. So honestly, if you're looking for a book with a villain who has a disability, specifically EDS, I would recommend another Elizabeth and skip the Taken Ones altogether. They have very different tones. Again, another Elizabeth is very dark, very twisted. If you have issues with like body horror, maybe don't read it, content warning. It's a serial killer book. And then The Taken Ones is very like police procedural, detective. There's obviously some gruesome things in there as well. I just 
can't in good conscience recommend a book where the disability was handled so poorly. All right, so two out of three of the thrillers that I picked at the beginning of this video I loved. That is not a bad summer reading plan if you ask me. Plus you got a bonus recommendation of another book, another summer thriller you could put on your list. I hope you enjoyed this reading vlog, this kind of style. This is kind of the direction that I'm going to be taking the channel in, at least for now until I completely change my mind again. But yeah, I'm going to kind of be focusing on three to four books in a vlog, all kind of centered around a, the same theme or similar styles or same author, anything really, anything that like pairs well together or maybe even clashes. So if there are any fun themes that you would like me to explore in the coming months, if there are any books that you think I must read and include in a reading vlog, leave it in the comments below. Also, let me know what summer thrillers you are looking forward to this year. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.